Thanks very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Climate Emergency Advisory Committee for the, and I'm just checking the date, the 9th of March, 2022. I hope you're all doing really well. Um, I've got some opening remarks as usual, and we'll do some introductions and some housekeeping and just um, <clears throat> identify where we sort of switch the agenda around a little bit today. <clears throat> so we're being broadcast live, and I've got a terrible cough, so apologies for that. Um, it, it's why we can to enable public access. It's been, not been held as a public meeting in accordance with the Local Government Act 1972. As such, is it a remote consultative meeting, the Climate Emergency Advisory Committee? The consultative status of today's meeting means that some of the usual formalities will not play, take place at the start of the meeting. This also means that the committee will not be in a position to take any formal decisions and where necessary, any proposed actions that do refer, require formal ratification will be referred to the next formal public meeting of the committee for approval. And you could all tell I was reading that. Please now remind members to turn the microphones off, microphones off and they're not speaking and use the hand raising function to indicate they would like to speak as we move through the agenda. Um, indicate vividly so you catch my eye that also works too so let's do some introductions so i'm going to go through the the alphabetical order on my on my uh, on my notes here so first of all councillor anderson councillor barry anderson adlin wharfdale ward thank you very much councillor buckley uh thank you chair councillor neil buckley or woodley ward um councillor carlil Morning, everyone. Councillor Peter Carlyle, Carlyle and Farsley Ward. Do we have a Councillor Dobson with us? Don't think we do. Councillor Finnegan? I don't think Robert's joined us yet, so let's move on. Uh, Councillor Flint? Morning, it's Emma Flint from Wheatwood Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Forsyth? Good morning, Councillor Anne Forsyth, Farnley and Wortley Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Garthwaite. Good morning, Councillor Garthwaite, heading in Hyde Park Ward. Thank you. Do we have Councillor Hartbrook with us? Good Let's morning, Councillor Hartbrook. Oh, we do. Oh, Fantastic. Well. Thank you, Conor. I'd, I'd not seen you there. My apologies. Councillor Hayden. Um, good morning. Sorry you dipped out there. Um, Councillor Helen Hayden, Temple Newsom Ward, an exec member for Infrastructure and Climate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Shazad. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Mohamed Shazad from the Mortal and Meanwood Ward. Thank you. Councillor Wadsworth. Morning, Councillor Paul Wadsworth, guys in Roden Ward. And I think Councillor Ray is joining us a little late. His meeting is going to overrun. Fantastic, right? Hello, hello, Chair. You skipped over me. Oh my word! I am very <laughs> I sorry. Terribly, 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 terribly mortified. Anyway, it's Councillor Ray we're from Kirkstall Ward. <laughs> sorry about that, John. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, right, officers to introduce themselves. So, first of all, Polly Cook. Hi, good morning. Polly Cook, Chief Officer for Sustainable Energy and Air Quality. Thank you very much. Harriet Spate. Good morning. Harriet Spate, um, Governance Officer to the Committee. Thank you very much. Right, so um, we have people joining us for various items. They can introduce themselves at, at those items. That's great. So item number one, apologies. Uh, Harriet, any apologies? Uh, no apologies, Chair. Okie dokie. Any Number two, any declarations of interest, colleagues? I'm not seeing any indications. Three, then, is the notes from 17th of January meeting, which is pages five to eight. So if we turn to our notes and just let me get those to come up. Has anyone got any matters arising? <clears throat> As I'm looking at the PDF document, if anyone's got any matters arising, they could speak up, that, that would be great. Um, otherwise, I will take silence as acceptance. We <clears throat> if you remember it was the future fashion update. <clears throat> okay, good. Right, we're all good with that. Okay, so next item. Um, well, let's move on. To, we, we're doing open forum and working groups at the end. We're doing the item four is going to be the climate adaptation update which Paul is going to introduce in a moment. And then item five is the um, executive board 
climate emergency <clears throat> annual report. Oh, my throat's going to play havoc with me today, I can see. Which also Polly's going to introduce and do an overview so we can um, have discussion and debate on both these items. So <clears throat> in order to save my throat, <laughs> Polly, if you could introduce item four, that'd be really helpful. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, so we thought it was really important at SEAC to actually do a session that focused on adaptation and resilience. Um, and it's one of our commitments in the exec board report that I'll cover later is to really make sure that we're looking at that as a council. So in order to start that discussion, we've got Jonathan Moxon with us today from the council who um, works more specifically on flood, um, but is working with us to look at the wider adaptation piece. And then we've also invited Rosa Foster, um, who's from the Environment Agency to give the Environment Agency view, but is also one of the chairs of the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission's Adaptation and Resilience Group. And then finally, we've asked Richard Emmett from um, Yorkshire Water, because Yorkshire Water are one of the organisations that are kind of leading the way in terms of their preparation. Obviously, there are a lot of direct impacts on them in terms of some of the climate change. So we thought that gave a really good start in terms of the committee, in terms of understanding. And we will also talk about our next steps um, and fundamentally we are looking at going to executive board in July with an adaptation and resilience um, plan for the council and um, so without further ado I shall hand over to Jonathan to start to take us through the, the session so thank you Polly uh, yeah good morning everybody I think um, many of you will know me um, from my sort of substantive role as, as the council's flood risk manager uh, for those that don't yeah, I've got an overview of flood risk management for the city, but a big part of that is having a, a broader look at climate resilience in the round. And I've been working with Polly and her team a little while on this. And as you mentioned, Polly, there's um, a lot more detail this time in the exec board report around our sort of response to the climate emergency that focuses on resilience and adaptation. So hopefully there's there's a little bit more background and, and context there to sort of set the scene for this um, for this discussion today we've we've prepared a few slides um i'll just uh, share my screen if that's okay um oh, i can't i can't share my screen oh no so that harriet i don't know if that's something you hang can on enable. yeah if you could just bear with us one minute um we'll, we'll make sure um, that you can just while harriet's doing that then just to sort of pick up on on this we've, we've set a time there you go jonathan you should be able to for the for the summer to have um, what we would call an adaptation uh, plan in place um, then but there'll be work on this you know long into the future and I think what we want to do today is at least um, set the scene hopefully you can see my slide um, I'll just double check that that's okay it, it says you've started screen sharing but there's no slide up there yet oh that's not very helpful okay uh, unless anyone's seeing something different but yeah it's come up now the slide's there Thank you. Ah, I just needed to click in it and then it was it was going. That's fine. OK, so we've just got a few slides I, I will rattle through that set some context. We're not we're not really scratching the surface, but it's just to, to help um, to set the scene. Um, so I suppose just very quickly to sort of highlight what we what we mean. Um, adapt, adaptation and resilience are both terms that we we'll probably use slightly interchangeably, but to some extent, in order for us to adapt, to climate change, one of the aspects of that is about being more resilient to the impacts that it has. So I suppose that's my easy way of trying to sort of describe those two terms. Uh, a key principle of the National Committee on Climate Change has been around sort of highlighting the degree of warming that we'd see globally and what that might mean, and then thinking about the impacts that that would have in various locations around the globe. We commonly talk about adapting to a two degree warming situation or scenario. But I think it's important to also note that we, in, in lots of circumstances, we also think about up to four degrees of warm, warming and what, what that would have. And there's quite a stark difference between what a two degree change is globally and the impacts that it has locally in, in the UK and what a four degree warming would be. So just to set that scene, that's the type of thing we're talking about. Um, and we, we clearly don't, don't know what we will face in future but I think the second bullet point tries to highlight the fact that we're, we're highlighting adaptation today in as opposed to mitigation but the two things are very important 
in their own right and they need to work together and they do have an impact on each other so the more we do on mitigating the impacts of climate change by reducing carbon emissions and hitting net zero targets the less adaptation we have to do um, but clearly the impacts of climate change are already being felt and um, to that end we know we will have to adapt it's not a choice we will have to adapt but to the degree and the extent to which we have to adapt will be determined by the, the progress we make on on mitigating a couple of quotes here i won't um read them out verbatim but i think what what we're trying to highlight here is that at a national level um across all parties at government level in the uk we recognize that the costs um the cost of not adapting uh, are much higher than the cost of of doing what we can to become more resilient and to adapt to the impacts of climate change there's been a more recent um inter-parliamentary uh, committee on climate change um report about this and it's a uh, lots of national level reports are really having a much bigger focus on climate resilience and and how essential that is so um yeah just in february the, the latest reports out i think that might be the link that you've put in the chat harriet so i think it, it, there's a much bigger focus now on this element and a realization that we do really need to plan for this going forward. Just to highlight, you will have seen some of these pictures. We sort of tried to give a sense of what's happening across the world. But, you know, pictures there in Germany of um, devastating flooding. But it's important to recognize that severe weather and, and the impacts of global warming um, are not limited to flooding. Um, we've, we've experienced that in this city, obviously, um, on many occasions. As recently as as um, a couple of weeks ago for those that have wards that were affected um but we we tend to hark back to boxing day 2015 you know that that's the biggest flood the city has seen um and it was devastating and you know you three and a half thousand properties many of them many hundreds nearly 700 businesses um but the costs were, were over 35 million that their direct costs and i think we were not it's not that easy sometimes to draw the line into indirect costs and and impacts on wider supply chains um and i think it's important that we draw attention to other weather severe weather related impacts and the impacts on infrastructure so yeah I, i'm keen to say that because i am sat here as a flood risk manager for Leeds city council but i'm i think that there are we really do need to up, up the rhetoric and the game around other climate risks heat and cold and wind and all the things that we've seen in the last 12 months that impact on our city um, could become more frequent, more severe, more significant with climate change. We really think it will, and we need to start to prepare for that. I think this table just tries to highlight that, that this is this is not our, our data, this is the Met Office, and I think we, we, we need to trust the scientists on this. And their models and their predictions through work that's include included in the likes of the UK CP18 work, which was basically their joint work with other authorities to try and predict different climate models and scenarios and the impacts that that would have on the UK. Um, and in all cases, I think we're fairly confident that we're in um, we're in for a tough future. Um, and the impacts that different weather patterns have. And the severity of them on infrastructure, on people's supply chain, on our ability to use land, the impact on um, biodiversity and the natural environment, but also people and our ability to function as a society is um, it's stark. Um, and that's, and, and you know, the science supports that. So I think more on, on what we are trying to do um, is just to flag that, as, as Polly introduced earlier, so that. There was a, a national adaptation program that tried to set some parameters around what the expectation is on local authorities and, and as a national government as well. Um, there's a national level on a very recently published um, climate, climate risk assessment um, that highlighted eight sort of priority areas for action. Um, and I think we, we've sort of taken a lead from that and, and what that states. I won't go through them in detail, but it, in effect, as an example, we're talking about you know direct loss of habitat direct impacts on our ability to use the land productively 
to feed ourselves or to provide products that go into various supply chains that that affect our daily lives um impacts on infrastructure um i will use a flood example but you know that the train station in the city center was closed for for a number of hours in the recent storms and that you know was linked to a particular incident but that incident was caused by significant flooding um wildfires in in february in recent years have, have affected aviation um you could say ironically but th these are these are direct impacts that come that we've already seen this is before you know the situation uh, worsens just to flag as, as a local authority it's important that we we plan for this we take a leading role in the city and it'd be really helpful to hear from rosa and richard after this in terms of setting some context what other organizations are doing but from our perspective we already have a series of responsibilities and roles um civil contingencies act is there for us to provide that um incident response emergency planning role as a city for the benefit of everybody that lives and works in the city um and that that isn't specific to any particular type of incident that is about any incident that causes an impact and it and um, affects the way that we operate as a city and we already plan for that we have a significant number of plans in place including um severe weather plans um and more specifically around flood and other um uh incidents such as heat um and that's a place we, we need to look at and we need to look at it in the context of a changing climate and whether those plans are fit for the purpose that they needed for in future. Um, the Flood and Water Management Act is the ch chief um, I suppose legislation that my, my teams work under, but that spreads out across um, many parts of the council, um, puts a specific responsibility on us to protect our city from the impacts of climate change and flooding uh, long into the future through development, but equally on other things about maintaining and managing our assets and setting a strategy for the future. And we've already got elements in that strategy, flood risk strategy, that talk to the climate narrative. But again, we need to continuously review these plans and make sure that they're, they're fit for purpose for the future. The Environment Act has recently been refreshed just last year, um, places responsibilities on, on lots and lots of different organisations, and Rosa and Richard will both be very familiar with that in particular. But from our perspective, it, it, does, it does make it important that we, we recognise the natural environment as a as an important asset um and that's that's there and it talks a lot in that refreshed act about climate resilience uh, and biodiversity sort of emergency as well as the climate emergency uh, just to very quickly for those uh, and i know many of you will are very familiar with the planning system uh, the local plan update is ongoing now um and, and that specifically talks to to climate emergency and, and a lot of that work that they've done uh, is is specifically to reflect the impacts of climate change, how we become more resilient as a city and using our ability through the planning system to do that. Just very quickly as an example, I think um, we've got a number of flood schemes going on in the city and we've got a number of climate risks that sit away from flooding, but just to highlight the sort of the scale of investment that we're putting into place to protect us long into the future as a standard, we deliver flood schemes by estimating the impacts of climate, excuse me, of climate change, and then building the infrastructure to withstand and resist that level of impact. So it's a standard that already exists. So we, we predict what global warming impacts would be in this area. We model that and we build defences that, that try and um, mitigate um, the impacts. Um, by therefore, by virtue, we are adapting the city to what we think the future looks like as a result of climate change. Um, we've used the picture on the on the top right is 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 Nostrop Weir. That's something that only existing leads. Uh, we're the only place in the UK that uses movable weirs um, to control water levels for specifically to reduce the risk of flooding. Um, they operated uh, successfully in the last couple of weeks, but we've 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 got more assets to build and more things to do to allow us to adapt. Um, the, the bottom two um, images are, are just around the, imp the the things that we can do through the construction process, just so a little nod to mitigation there as opposed to adaptation. But we again, it highlights that point I made on the first slide around the two things do have to work together. Um, the point as well is worth, worth highlighting that the 
the carbon cost of delivering a scheme like Leeds Fast 2 isn't actually anywhere near as much as the carbon cost of the impact or the, that's felt by the impact of a flood like the Boxing Day flood in 2015. So to set that in context, to go back again to what I said earlier, the cost of inaction, whether that's through carbon or, or financial cost, is, is far higher than the actions we need to take. And that's a really important point and why this is essential. Um, so I think that's my um, last slide. So just, just to highlight that um, there's some practical things that we've, we've started to do and we wanted to flag that today and set some context that we've, we've ad adopted the local partnerships adaptation toolkit. So that's been done in conjunction with the L LGA uh, it's a really good toolkit. Um, working with with Polly's team, we've we've looked at that, um, and we think that's the right way forward to sort of use their toolkit and their guidance to start to identify the risks that we face as a city, and then work with services to work out what what adaptation we need to make to the risk assessments, to the actions that we've put in place to mitigate those risks. Um, and I think that 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 process has already started. So we're looking across corporate risks and service level risks um, and working with directorates to, to look at where those risks need to be tweaked and updated in the light of a climate emergency and therefore to, and then to, to lead on to a plan that would put actions in place or to look at where we need to invest or, or change policies or change practices uh, to mean that we are adequately you know, um, mitigating those risks. As Paul mentioned at the start, an adaptation and resilience plan, the plan is to bring that to exec board in July. I think it's important maybe to know, and we might come on to this in the discussion, is, is that that's the start of a process. Mm -hmm. I think we need to identify the risks and then we need to move, move on from there and, and we need to see you know, many years of, of action and adaptation. It will take time uh, and it will take energy and this is the start of the, the process. Um, I'll just stop uh, sharing my slides if that's all right. Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. It was very illuminating. I, what we'll do, folks, is we'll have all our speakers on adaption and then we'll we'll, we'll move to, to, to questions and discussion if that's okay. So who's next then? So I think it's Rosa next. Hi, Rosa. Brilliant. Thanks. Hi. Sorry, <clears throat> hit the screen share button before I said hello and now I need to pass <clears throat> Okay, apologies. Um, okay, so I'll talk you through, um, uh, like I'll share a bit about the Environment Agency's response to the climate emergency and how we're framing things within our organisation um, and some of the key findings from our climate adaptation uh, reports that we have to, so we have to produce, a, um, we're statutorily required to uh, produce a report every three years um, on, on our approach to adaptation. Um, so I'll, I'll share the findings from that. So our, our latest one was in October last year. Um, and then I'll change hats and uh, I'll share a bit about the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission and the actions in that, in that plan. And then I'll hand over to Richard who uh, talk to you about Yorkshire Water. Okay, so um, and I always want to say thank you for having us here today. Um, it's really great to talk to you. And some of you I know from um, previous uh, sessions around the Leeds City Council's um, Climate Commission and also the consultation session. So it's really nice to see you again. Okay, so um, within the organisation, we, uh, we've we created uh, something called our Climate Ambition. We launched this in May last year, and um, I guess I want to share this because it, it, it's pretty comprehensive. It's obviously, it's quite high level. It doesn't include everything. Things like this can't, but it is a really neat um, way of framing everything that we do within the Environment Agency on climate change. So the three key facets here. So at the bottom, we've got uh, what we're calling walking the walk um, or talk maybe um, but uh, about you know how we improve what we do ourselves around uh, becoming net zero and adapting our own assets and our buildings um, to, to planning for a four degree change so Jonathan mentioned that so we've set ourselves a standard of let's like we'll aim to do everything we can to help UK achieve net zero and like achieve the uh, you know, like not go above the two degree uh, change, but equally we'll plan and make sure that we are ourselves are resilient for that worst case scenario of a four degree change. Um, 
and then the stuff in there around like our uh, resource consumption as well which obviously plays as you everyone on this call will know plays in massively into becoming net zero in and of itself and on the top right hand side we've got um where it's our work calls such as this i suppose a part of this this sector but really our strategic planning work um you know in our statutory roles around um supporting planning authorities to understand the cp18 uh, uh modeling scenarios and making sure that we really are uh, collectively making our places resilient to all the different aspects of climate change um we've got preparing and uh for current and future impacts that's partly our incident response again that's with local resilience forums and a really important facet of our work um, and uh, working with partners to attract in investment. So again, sessions like this supporting the Climate Commission, uh, the Orchard and Humber uh, Climate Commission as well, um, a really key, key aspects of our work. And then the right hand side is something that um, is really gaining momentum now that the UK has issued um, its own net zero strategy. So the Environment Agency has a really key role to play. We regulate the carbon markets um, already. So the uh, you know emissions trading schemes, we regulate those centrally. Um, we've got a role to play around supporting uh, regulated businesses and industries to drive down their greenhouse gas emissions. And for this region, it's really pivotal. Um, we're working with Bayes um, and MHCLG around the Humber. Uh, industrial cluster, and um, you know, recognizing the the the, the role of decarbonizing that in in achieving the UK net zero ambitions. So that that is starting to really grow for us, um, and yeah, at all levels, I guess, supporting and helping um, a, a circular economy come come into being. Uh, oh no, sorry, wrong button, <laughs> wrong screen. Apologies, Just trying to. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I think um, living with a, so this is the title of our, our report um, that I mentioned before. So living better with a changing climate. Um, I've, I've sent these slides to Harriet so you can get these um, separately by email. And where it's underlined, they're hyperlinked, so you can go to the to the national report of this. There's a really nice sort of set of slides that give that national view. So I've just pulled out some key messages for today, um, but you're obviously very welcome, and I would encourage you to go and have a look at it. Um, so yeah, basically, as Jonathan said, you know, significant climate impacts are inevitable um, across a whole range of uh, sectors um, and environmental risks. We're preparing. Um, for climate impacts by working with government, businesses and communities. Um, and the, the importance, I guess the whole report really emphasises the importance of early action. So the more that we do now, the more we will mitigate those financial and economic impacts um, on our, our communities and our businesses and our, uh, you know, our economy um, by, uh, by early, early planning. Um, and anticipating and investing early, it will be a lot easier if we start to make those changes now. So uh, we've got then five climate reality checks, and these are quite stark, I suppose. So um, as as we know well with, with our partnership with Leeds, it's a great flagship for us um, nationally as well as within the region. Um, but the Environment Agency can't uh, protect everyone from increasing flood risks and, and coastal flood risks. Um, it, it's going to take a, a collective effort, um, and actually, there's going we go. We have to take a different approach. That we have to increase resilience um, rather than just um, only looking for infrastructure solutions. There, there, there has to we have to take a different approach. And our SCRM uh, national, sorry, pardon the jargon, our national flood risk management and coastal risk management strategy. Again, a statutory document we have to produce was uh, signed off last year, talks really clearly about creating a nation of climate champions um, and really bringing forward uh, the, the concepts of climate resilience alongside investing in infrastructure. Um, climate change makes it harder to ensure clean and plentiful water. That is going to be a real challenge. Um, and whilst we're in the north and it does rain a lot and we naturally talk about flooding, um, you know, <laughs> uh, and we do, uh, it is also a really pertinent issue for Yorkshire um, and, you know, it's a, a testament to the great work that Yorkshire Water have done 
since the 1990s droughts that we are as we've been as resilient as we have been but um yeah there is uh, a lot of work to do and i won't say more on that because that richard will talk to that environmental regulation um you know it's not we our chief exec and chair have been really clear that what we've got at the moment isn't ready for climate change um and so we need to do a lot of work with central government and defra in particular around making sure that our regulatory work is is um adapting to the changes that we see so it's quite uh, that, that's a really important piece of work for us um, and, and not easy. Um, our ecosystems can't adapt as fast as the climate is changing. So the biodiversity crisis, uh, you know, the concept of that sort of compounding on itself um, because it can't adapt to the chain, changes is, is very real. And there is just a reality about the fact that there will be more and worse environmental incidents and it will be across the range. So not just flood risk, but like 2020 was quite a telling year. So part of the pandemic, which some might say is also has its roots in um, not being sustainable, like sustainable globally, but um, just on environmental risks, you know, we went from very, very, very wet winter, multiple major flood events across Yorkshire, straight into a period of prolonged dry weather and drought planning through that summer. So, you know, it's, it's very, it's not in the future. We are seeing these issues play out for us now. We have wildfires on our moorlands, um, you know, the carbon emissions from that compound the issue. So we do, this is live and it's real, it's not It's not in the future. Um, so uh, the plan, like our report sets out a call to action and basically we framed our, our work around um, those, those five climate realities under eight different themes and they're set out to the right there. So, you know, accelerating our approach to adaptation uh, really thinking differently and challenging the status quo. So you know, a good example is that regulatory conversation. So just not, not accepting that and driving that change. Uh, very much uh, creating collaborations and working with partners, trying to bring in that investment for change and working with nature and how we do that, working with partners and um, stakeholders and businesses and so on to design those low, low carbon futures all the while strengthening community resilience to a whole range of different things and i think that's a really um uh, there's just so much work that we can do together there between the environment agency and local authorities and much obviously uh by the nature of your work you're much more integrated into local communities and how can we do that more effectively i'm really keen to explore that and then helping up helping businesses um prepare and obviously stepping up to level up so that's it for the Environment Agency. I'll quickly move on to the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission. So just draw your attention to the fact that if you click on either the picture or the, the three minute introduction, it will take you to um, a YouTube uh, video, which is a really short three minute video that introduces you to the Climate Commission and the uh, action plan itself. And it's really compelling um, and would be uh, something you could share with um, yeah, fellow councillors or members of the public really comfortably. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool. So just briefly, the Yorkshire Number Climate Commission is an independent advisory body. You can see the structure on the right hand side. But basically, we've got a series of standing panels and we've got two uh, working groups that support those. So I chair the Climate Resilience Working Group. and We've got a net zero working group. And um, one of the things we're really keen on is that we give the, the commission gives equal weight to both climate resilience and net zero um, and that we make sure that we make those connections between those two issues, because we could it is possible to create a low carbon future that is not resilient to climate change. And we absolutely cannot afford to do that. We have to make a climate ready, low carbon future. Um, in the round. So uh, the, the work of the Commission will be really helpful um, to everybody in the region to support that. The, the Climate Action Plan uh, was based on extensive st stakeholder engagement um, through the first nine months of the Commission's being um, and involved over 500 people from across the region. Um, it is a, it's a positive construction, uh, a constructive document. Um, it's very forward looking. Um, some of the actions are a bit of a rally cry to the region. There's sort of things to aim for. Um, and we're in the in the process at the moment within the working group of working out like exactly what what does that mean in terms of actions? What's going to what's going to really add value 
and then the next two years means that we're in a like totally different place on all things climate. Um, we've achieved the step changes that we need to see. We've supported partners um, and businesses and communities to, to start making those step changes. Um, it has, there are, I guess there are two things to share. Um, there's a lot of detail on these next two slides, so apologies for having to skip through. I'm just really aware of time, but there's um, we've, the commission plan sets out a framework for change. So these sort of 13 overarching actions that apply to all facets of um, climate uh, preparedness. So resilience, net zero, um, to, you know, working towards a just transition and nature and biodiversity. These uh, you know, responding to nature and biodiversity crisis and bringing that in uh, to all our decision making. Um, these themes uh, really ap apply to all of those. And then there are a, a number of um, key actions relating to climate resilience. Um, and I think the, the focus that this um, advisory committee is giving uh, climate resilience in the round is just really, really important. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think the work that Leeds City Council are doing um, to start addressing some of these issues from your perspective, is really very, very powerful. Uh, so yes, like I said, 50, 50 big ideas for Yorkshire. They're a call, call to arms, really. There's plenty in there. As, as a minimum, do check out that little uh, YouTube link that I share, uh, I mentioned. Um, and yeah, if you can, have a look at the plan and we can start to think about what, what it means for, for mm -hmm. Leeds and Leeds' role in that in the region beyond what it's doing already, which is brilliant. So thank you, I'll stop there. Thanks, Rosa. We just, you know, we, we, we absolutely do love flattery on this this committee. So, you know, but, but thanks for your very kind words. None um, of it is false. <laughs> uh, the 20 quid's in the post. Right. Um, next up. Um, so we've got Richard now from... Oh, yes, of course, Richard. Sorry, I was looking and I couldn't see you, Richard. So over to you. Right. Helps if I start by unmuting. Um, uh, Afternoon, uh, morning, everybody. My name is Richard Emmett, and I'm Corporate Affairs Director at Yorkshire Water. My job is really to kind of manage our relationships with institutions in Yorkshire, with national government and uh, public policy uh, positions. Uh, and very specifically within Yorkshire, it's all about um, delivering uh, our work and building partnerships with other um, stakeholders in the, in the county. And I'll come back to that at the end of my brief uh, comments. I did start with a, with a short apology uh, in that there was quite a lot of work uh, going on outside the street works. It's not, however, Leeds City Council street works, it's York Council street works. So I can't make any complaints to uh, councillors <laughs> on this panel about that. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Uh, and I promised you three things this afternoon, really, uh, this morning rather. Uh, talk briefly through why, make, why climate change uh, and adaption and mitigation matters for Yorkshire Water. Um, I want to talk about um, what we're doing to kind of reduce our carbon impact uh, within the business and within our assets. And then finally, talk about a little bit about why partnership and working in collaboration with others, like the environment agency, like the councils, uh, is crucial to uh, what we're trying to achieve. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common saying in the water industry um, that basically your problems in the sector, when you get problems, they tend to come from two things. It's either from too much water or from too little. It's from the extremes. So when you're looking at a, at a phenomenon like climate change, which basically means that most, both of those extremes become more probable and more frequent, then I think that gives you a sense of the impact of, of, of climate change uh, on an organisation like ourselves as a provider of an essential public surface. It means that we'll be dealing with periods of uh, exceptionally high rainfall in winters uh, and uh, the consequent issues of flooding, damage to our assets, and we'll also have a supply demand issue uh, throughout longer, drier summers. Um, but this isn't a future issue as far as we're concerned. As Rosa mentioned earlier, this is an issue for the here and now, and I think Jonathan's SERP slides also illustrated this. Um, so, I mean, I've been at Yorkshire Water since 2017, uh, and in that period, uh, we have had one drought in 2018, one period of prolonged uh, low rainfall, prolonged dry weather that Rosa referred to earlier in 2019, coinciding with the, with the pandemic. We've had two freeze-thaw events, 
and at least six or possibly seven uh, named storm events with uh, very significant impact across uh, Yorkshire 2019, lots of impact in the Don catchment down in Sheffield, Doncaster and Fish Lake. And Jonathan referred to the more recent storm impacts um, uh, back in February. So uh, there's obviously a, a cost to this on, on two levels. There's a, there's a human cost to this in terms of the disruption to people's lives. Uh, there's a strong correlation between people who have uh, repeated exposure to flooding and uh, chronic mental health problems. Flooding also tends to affect uh, the more uh, disadvantaged communities by dint of, uh, sort of housing stock and, and where they are. Um, but for us, there's also a very significant financial cost. So if, I, if we were to tot up the cost impact for some of the events that uh, I just mentioned to you, uh, it would be an, somewhere between 100 and 150 million uh, of additional costs that we've incurred over the last uh, five years. And we now have, have reached uh, quite a, a start, uh, sort of startling point where we are close to being uninsurable for flood risk. Um, because of that claims history. Um, uh, a number of other water companies have, have kind of crossed that uh, threshold and now effectively have to self-insure, as indeed some local authorities do. So that, I think, gives you a sense of the, of the, of the here and now and why this matters um, to us and some of the costs involved. Uh, in the longer term, the issue, um, apart from adaptation and mitigation, uh, is really around uh, supply and demand. As Rosa mentioned earlier, I think you know Yorkshire is uh, has generally been a very water resilient region. That's partly to do with climate uh, and geography. We have the Pennine where it rains a lot. Uh, we have East Yorkshire where it rains rather less. Um, but nonetheless, because of some investments we put in in the late nineties, we have the ability to kind of move water east, west, and north, south uh, across the region, which makes us uh, resilient. I think we also owe quite a lot to the sort of our municipal. Uh, predecessors uh, in Leeds and Bradford who invested heavily in water resource uh, storage uh, in the central Pennines um, from the early 20th century onwards. And we, uh, we are obviously benefiting from that uh, level of investment. So historically, we are a resilient region for those reasons with a high average rainfall and with a good uh, water grid. However, that starts to become uh, under uh, increasing stress when you consider the impact of growing population. So Yorkshire's population, I think, is, is uh, predicted to grow by approximately a million uh, by 2050. Uh, and it is likely that we will have no more. Uh, so we're basically, we will have to supply a growing population with roughly the same amount of water that we have currently. And um, so that presents to us uh, a significant challenge. And we have to manage for a higher frequency of severe droughts and plan for those in our, in our long-term planning assumptions. Um, we, we, we plan our water resources work on a 25-year kind of uh, framework and we're got, kind of got going through the water resource management planning at the moment in consultation with stakeholders across Yorkshire. And uh, we're doing the same on the drainage and wastewater side. And I know that Jonathan has been directly uh, involved in that. So that's, if you like, presents, I think, uh, quite a clear picture of the impact. In terms of what Yorkshire Water is doing uh, uh, to, to, do, to do our bit and, and reduce our own uh, sort of carbon impact, uh, we have a commitment to be net zero by 2030. So that's quite an aggressive uh, early commitment there. Um, and there are a number of ways in which we can, we, can, uh, we can move that forward. Clearly, energy is a big issue for us. We are an intensive energy user on both the water and wastewater treatment side, uh, we've moved to a position where we are, we now source something like 100% of our energy supply from renewable sources, so that's positive. We've also invested quite heavily in self-generation, uh, both through use of uh, anaerobic digesters on some of our wastewater treatment works uh, and a certain amount of, of wind power. So Jonathan showed the slide earlier of Nostrop Weir, very close to that is uh, Nostrop uh, wastewater treatment works, which, saw, which serves uh, most of the population of Leeds. And um, that uh, is almost entirely self sufficient with energy now as a result of uh, a big anaerobic digester on the plant and the, uh, the large uh, wind, wind tower that you see uh, as you drive down the A63 there on the left hand side. Um, we're also looking at uh, some significant investments around solar making use of redundant uh, land around some of our assets. 
uh, and I'll come on land uh, to want to land a little bit later. So energy is important. Obviously, we need to look at how we can decarbonize our fleet. Um, not all the solutions are currently in place for us to be able to do that. We don't have yet sufficient sort of commercial vehicles with the sort of range and resilience that we would need to continue to provide um, servicing to our customers. But clearly, we uh, expect that to change uh, in the coming years as the market grows. Probably the most challenging area for us in terms of, uh, uh, of reducing our own emissions is process emissions. In other words, predominantly the gases um, that come off our wastewater treatment works, um, which is probably the area where we have biggest, what you might call innovation gap in terms of how we get to net zero. That is still work in progress and we don't have all the solutions as to how we will be able to do that. The other thing that we do have uh, is a significant amount of land. Uh, we're Yorkshire's uh, second largest landowner with about 28,000 hectares of land, second to the Crown. Uh, and the next is the church after that. It's always the Crown and the church in these, uh, in these cases. Uh, I mean, clearly that gives us, uh, I think, two levels of opportunity. One is to use that estate for, in that, particularly in the Pennine Uplands, for uh, natural flood management, for tree planting, uh, for kind of nature-based interventions that will uh, that will help for things like peatland restoration as well, uh, which we work on at sort of at scale in partnership with with, with other landowners, um, and it also gives the opportunity to do some offsetting uh, as far as you know in, on a, in a responsible fashion of, of of other areas of our kind of carbon impact. Um, there's also a significant impact, uh, I think, imperative on us to be much more efficient. Um, clearly, if we can encourage our customers to use less water, then it requires less energy from us in processing it and pumping it uh, around the region. Uh, our responsibility on the other side of that is to lose less uh, through leakage, and we have some quite aggressive leakage targets over the next uh, five to 10 years. Just finally, if I may, I'll touch on the whole issue of partnership working. Um, I mean, Rosa mentioned earlier, um, I, it, it, it's, it's, it's self-evident to us that both from a, an adaptation and a sort of mitigation perspective, the only way forward for us is to kind of work in partnership with other bodies uh, across Yorkshire. Uh, flooding uh, does, is not a respecter of boundaries. Rivers don't just follow one organisational or geographical uh, 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 border. So we have to respect that and collaborative working is the key. Um, so to, um, to take that forward, what we've done is, is build a, a series of flooding and resilient partnerships. So we have an organisation called Living with Water in Hull, which brings us uh, together ourselves, the Environment Agency and the, and the two local authorities, kind of deal with uh, flooding incidents on both a strategic and an operational uh, level. We've just put in place a similar partnership uh, in, in the Don catchment in South Yorkshire, uh, working with the Mayoral Combined Authority, Doncaster, Barnsley, uh, Rotherham uh, and Sheffield. Uh, and I'm very keen to create a similar sort of uh, partnership for West Yorkshire uh, as well. And we've been having some conversations with the uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority and, and the new mayor to see how we can move that and uh, forward. And Jonathan's been involved in some very interesting work um, surrounding that. Final area of partnership we're working is with other landowners. We form this thing called the Yorkshire Land Network. I have this sort of idea that if you bring all the big institutional landowners together, you can do some really interesting things in terms of uh, nature of recovery, uh, of change in land use, um, some pilot work we've done with farmers in some of the, um, the Derwent and Ooze catchment to change uh, the way they use the land has had significant impact on water retention in the soil, which reduces flooding, reduces the cost of treating water, and also has a very significant carbon impact. We're very keen to see how we can move those partnerships at scale across the rest of Yorkshire. So I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll leave it there, Councillor, and uh, happy to take any questions on that or, um, or, or anything else, if that would be helpful. Thanks, Richard. Um Folks, that was it. That's the longest concentrated bout of speaking we've had on an item, but we did start late. But I hope you understand it was important that our colleagues that have come to us today sort of could communicate the breadth and depth of what they're doing across across the um, across the whole span of, of adaptation. But I think an important thing to draw from all of this is that 
adaptation isn't the backup plan. Adaptation goes hand in glove with mitigation, and and the two obviously two sort of spheres of work overlap as well in, in to some degree. Right, I've got quite a few points to raise myself, but as I am but a benevolent chair, um, let's open the floor. And the first person I've got is Councillor Buckley. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, if it if it suits everybody, um, I'd like to ask a question to Richard, who made the, the, the final presentation, and then let others speak, um, and I can come back with other points from the earlier presentations. Sure, sure, why not? Um, Don't mind. But the, I, I was interested with, um, uh, I'm glad that Richard was here from Yorkshire Water because um, he, he made some very interesting points and um, it was all kind of um, high level corporate stuff, the kind of thing which um, sounds very good. I wonder if I can just bring this down to a very local level, but a very meaningful level. In my ward, or Woodley, in North Leeds, Yorkshire Water used to own two woods. One of them is just round the corner from where I live, and the other one is about a um, quarter of a mile or a bit less on Old Woodley Lane. And the shafts in the middle of the little woods are still, my understanding is they are still owned by Yorkshire Water, but Yorkshire Water have sold the woods. The result of this is that we are now having to fight a rear guard action with applications to knock down the woods and build dwellings. That's what it amounts to. Mm. And the question I would like to put to Richard is all the stuff which he mentioned sounds great. And I'm sure that there's a lot of good work there. But uh, he, he might well not be the man to ask, but I would like him to tell me how that squares with protecting the woods. And the one from around the corner from me is on a road called the Valley. We used to have owls in the wood and the person who now owns it and has put three applications in for various types of dwellings, the owls have gone, several trees have gone, the um, basic ground level of vegetation has been hoovered up at least three times and destroyed. Why has this been allowed to happen? And how does he square this with preventing climate change? Right, Th thanks Neil. Um, Richard, if you can answer that in either in detail or in not, that, that would be fine. Otherwise, you could take it out of this room and have a fight about it elsewhere, but you can give a brief answer. Uh, well, I'd probably do the latter, actually, because I didn't really come on sure. this call to deal with uh, individual wood issues of that nature. Clearly, I don't have an intimate knowledge of woods in our Woodley, um, and uh, I'm pleased that the councillor was uh, a, a sort of damn me with faint praise in terms of the corporate uh, comments that I made earlier. <laughs> Let me tell you, those are sincere. Um, yeah, uh, but it's not appropriate. I have no knowledge of uh, those words, but if the council would like to write to me, uh, I will look into uh, the issues that he raises and, of course, get back to him with a, with a full response. No worries. Take it outside, fellas. Um, OK, yeah. so, yeah. Neil, have you got points further towards the, the other adaptation thing? Oh, just... I was just going to say, rather than write, write to uh, Mr Emmett, um, I've made my point here, but perhaps he could take it up on my behalf. If, you, if you'd be kind enough just to send me some full details of what of the issue, um, the council colleagues have got my email address, so I'm sure yep. they'll be provide, help, happy to provide it with you. I'll deal with it, and I'll give you as full a response as I possibly can. Okay, thank there you. you. Can't say fairer than that. If, you, if it suits you, um, Chair, I'll come back with my other points later on. Good thing, no worries. Conrad, you're next yeah. to us. A um, couple of quick ones. Um, one, um, obviously, we're looking at this from a lead city council perspective, but obviously rivers don't respect the boundaries of any one particular city and mitigations taken in one area often have knock-on effects uh, in other areas. So, for example, your flood, flood mitigation that may be done in Leeds may knock down to, you know, Carwood and further downstream. 
and also you know flood mitigation or lack of flood mitigation in places uh, like Hebden Bridge where there's grouse moors I believe kind of you know the water if, if, if you're not slowing flows further upstream it, when you do get floods it kind of knocks down so I just wondered and I'm, this isn't aimed at any one particular I don't know who steps in I guess Richard from Watch Water might be able to answer but I, I, I'm curious as to the level of coordination in terms of works and programs yeah. across the span of the river um and that yeah that was the, that was the nub of the question yeah so uh, can I'm, Neil, I'm happy to to start with that well, and then we should try and pick it up because like so the the environment agency has a strategic overview for flood risk uh, Councillor. so um we uh we work really closely with calderdale and with uh yorkshire water on that specific geography but we've got a really well established um statutory uh framework across the orchard so we've got the regional flood and coastal committee sub-regional uh flood risk partnerships um, that so we've got one for West Yorkshire, which Jonathan is obviously a, a key supporting um, officer for, um, and those are you know and and what I think one of the great things that the chair of the regional flood and coastal committee, um, Colin Mellers, has been able to achieve in his tenure is really bringing in the combined authorities into those conversations. So we're starting to really see that. Um, that integration of infrastructure planning and uh, economic development um, just sort of happening very holistically. Um, those land use um, issues that you mentioned in Calderdale specifically, you know, they're, they are quite uh, they're quite complex. Um, but we're working uh, working very closely with um, with Yorkshire Water and with DEFRA around the use of reservoirs, um, and that is obviously I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of uh, that that work it's quite groundbreaking but it has a lot of challenges yeah. with it yeah. because obviously that's not what that infrastructure was um, designed for originally um, and it has a core purpose um, that is still very pertinent for the region so that's so, so, uh, Rosa, yeah, a lot of challenges. Is, yeah Rosa is it the environment agency that hold the power and the brief in that regard are they the overarching yeah, so we work, we support the regional flood and coastal <coughs> yeah. committee. So that brings together all the local authorities across the region and other risk management authorities like Yorkshire Water, the internal drainage boards, etc. And we support that committee. So it's a, the chair reports it um, to our to the Yorkshire area director, um, but it is um, they're in, kind of independently appointed by DEFRA. Um, so they sort of straddle and provide that uh, transparency and governance to flood risk spend. Uh, be it, uh, you know, central government grant and aid um, or the local levy funding that's pulled together from the local authorities. Understood. Thank you very much. Uh, there's quite a few other hands up, so I'll let Neil hand over to somebody else. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rosa. I mean, Rosa, that was an enormously <coughs> useful strategic overview because that was sort of one of the, the sort of list of questions I have is, is pinning it all together is quite it's quite difficult to discern sometimes. And um, uh, uh, I think, um, Richard, did you want to come in? Yeah, just briefly, Neil, not least not because I have to go, unfortunately, I've got another commitment uh, at 11. Um, but I think there's a profoundly important point there, which is you have to look at uh, these issues on a whole catchment basis. Yeah. Um, you know, what we do, you know, as far as uh, Sheffield is concerned, up in the Upper Don Valley uh, is as important as building concrete walls in the city centre. The whole thing has to be thought of as one, uh, as one system. And the Environment Agency, as, uh, as Rose said, kind of do lead on this with, with us and with other agencies. But it's a whole system approach you need to take. My apologies that I've had to, had to go, but the session uh, is overrunning slightly. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. Happy to come back. So. We, I, I, I tell you, if members have any burning questions for Yorkshire Water, I'm sure we can collate them and send them to you, Happy Richard. To there, is, them. Yeah. there is literally Sorry. no escape from us. I, I am afraid about that. But, uh, <laughs> listen, I'm not no, trying no, to escape. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for your contribution. It, 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 was, it was much appreciated. So if you want to quietly depart, you, you, you're very welcome to. Um, on that, folks, let's uh, move things along. Um, Council Forsyth. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I think Richard's already gone because... Um, some of my points were really sort of questions um, to him, so perhaps that, those can be uh, put onto the list of questions. To go. First of all, thank you very much, um, Jonathan and um, Rosa as well, for coming along and reminding us of why what we do is so very important here. And I'm, I'm also looking at the report as well to see in stark detail the risks 
And I don't want to talk too much about it, but I think thinking about soil health is really very important, but I think we're sort of concentrating more on water here. The question I was going to ask of Richard was, but it may, Rosa may well be able to answer that anyway, is something that I've asked about before. We've had it explained to us that we're going through longer periods of drought, so there's a water shortage, and we're going through periods when we've got a huge amount of water. Are any of the plans being put into place, and is this going into the local plan update, about actually harvesting rainwater and using it in the place where it falls? It's long, I do not, I've, I've long not understood why we need to be, excuse me for saying this, flushing our toilets with drinking standard water. There must be better ways of doing this. We've got to think differently about what we do. Surely that should be part of the retrofit plan. So my question is, is that something that's being looked at as well at, uh, you know, the, the um, Yorkshire and Humber um, Climate Commission yeah. level? I'm going to leave that one there because it, that really is the, just the one thing I wanted, point I really wanted to make again, I think. Yeah, just, just it is it, it is part of our um, policy discussions regarding the, the local plan review. Remember, remember folks, that's like the stuff we're going to do in the future, the areas we're going to regenerate. Um, and I, I trust, Anne, you'll be coming along to our policy workshops that are about to be uh, announced for members. And you can make those points. That'd be most helpful. Um, Rosa, Johnson, over to you guys regarding that. And Councillor Fawcett's questions. Yeah, so I guess um, soil health is really important. So it's really, it, it is really important that we don't just talk about uh, the water side of things. I think all aspects of it are really important. Obviously, soil health relates to food supply, um, pretty important. Um, it's also a carbon sink. It's quite hard to articulate and capture what the carbon sink is of soils, but there is work ongoing on that. And just because we can't count it doesn't mean we shouldn't be, um, you know, doing the right thing with it. So that is really important. Um, and, and it's great to hear you flag it. Um, in terms of uh, the planning, I think those are exactly the sort of things that we need to be starting to think about, Council Forsyth. So, um, yeah, I think that is where, where we're going in and doing energy retrofit on homes. Why aren't we doing or what, what do we need to do to enable us to do some resilience retrofit as well, to increase the independence of those properties um, and change some of those water supply aspects or reduce demand on the fittings. You know, there's a whole, there's a whole range of things you can do around a home to make it climate ready as well as, well, I guess climate ready in the round, so net zero and uh, resilient to different changes in climate. So um, yeah, I, I would welcome those conversations. Um, and in terms of uh, future supply, um, just on Richard's behalf, so we we regulate the water company. So it's a funny, it's a funny dynamic, obviously, with like, yeah. partnership with them, and we regulate their activity as well. Um, one of the things we do is regulate their 25 year planning. So they have to plan their water resource supply for 25 years and do that future forecasting on population growth and where they're going to generate the water from um, but where we're getting to now is actually they're having to collaborate across the north so that collaboration exists between the the three major water companies across the north of England um, to look at supply for the region because um, yeah climate as we've talked about climate pressure isn't geography specific um, and there will be a requirement to collaborate across the Pennines um, and north-south um, to make sure we're resilient into the future but that work is ongoing um, and I'm sure we can come back and talk about that more if, if you need or would like that at some point. Yeah I think we would um, so if, if Harriet can make a note of that that'd be, that'd be really useful. Um, right, um, Councillor Illingworth. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I listen to the debate and uh, listen to presentations. Uh, the thing which stuck out for me uh, was the lack of any mechanisms for conflict resolution. Inevitably, mm. there are different interests for different groups of people, different areas, which would come into conflict on occasion. I, unfortunately, looking at the system on the inside, I see the old blame culture and local government still alive and well. You, you defend your own patch, you never admit you're wrong. Uh, and uh, you don't really, people work in silos rather than working for a, a, a whole catchment solution. And it worries me, does that? I, I can see, looking at the minutiae of our adaptation, uh, we're not particularly good at conflict resolution. And I'm wondering what people think we could do to improve matters in the future. 
Okay, interesting question. Um, anyone? Yeah, so I think um, I think it's a really interesting point that um, where there might not be tensions now, there could easily be in the future, mm. couldn't there, with these pressures? Um, and I think that's where, um, so we're the Environment Agency promoting quite heavily um, an idea called um, adaptive pathways. So like one of the challenges with climate resilience in particular is that we're, we're planning for uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And that, like instinctively, businesses, people, we don't really like that. We need to know mm -hmm. the target. And I think you can see that in the maturity of the conversation around net zero. Um, you know, it's got very definite. There are numbers as metrics, you know, yeah. action. We can do that. It's like There's a lot of control around it. Climate resilience is much harder because it's about that uncertainty and planning for that and um, being able to adapt. But what I like about the approach in terms of conflict resolution is that you can you can look ahead and say, okay, well, but if we do that, then it, what what happens if that happens? And and in order to have those conversations, you need to have a range of different people around the room to feed in. So naturally, you're going with collaboration rather than ending up in a an us and them kind of place. And um, I, I do think Lise is doing brilliantly on this um, as well. And so, so we've we've had exactly that kind of conversation around the Leeds Flood Alleviation Scheme mm. and the Natural Flood Management Programme upstream um, and working with um, uh, Ma Martin Farrington and his team and Jonathan yeah. as part of that, you know, uh, looking at exactly how do we work with Bradford, with Craven, with the landowners? Um, how do we invest in soil improving soil health because actually mm. that's a really great way of reducing flood risk for the city so with uh, with we, we, we are doing i guess just to reassure and provide some visibility we're definitely starting that conversation and that way of thinking um but it's just it's got to permeate everything is the challenge and and not just be in uh like a, co a conversation about catchment management and thinking that doesn't have to do with planning it absolutely does like what else could leads do around soil aeration in its parks for example you know, to yeah. improve the catchment, um, you know, the quality of those soils, but also its its ability to absorb water and so on. You know, there's there's lots of things that we can do that you can take from the farmland and bring into the cities for sure. Um, so I hope that, that helps. Uh, no, it is really interesting. I mean, it's, we have just had a, a really tough road test of, of FAS2 and it's worked, as far as we can tell, in Leeds magnificently. And I think that's a testament to the work that people have done. I'm really conscious of time. So I've got Councillor Anderson, then Councillor Buckley. Just to start with, can I, can I thank the Environment Agency and Yorkshire Water for the way that they did the presentation this morning? I would argue that well, 90, 95, 96, 97% of the, the public in Leeds would be able to follow and buy in to what they have both said today. And what I would hope is that when we come out with our plans in July, they're equally uh, put forward in a constructive manner so that people can buy into it. Uh, but my specific point was, in a way, is back to Jonathan. Uh, when and a comment that Councillor Illingworth has just made just now about conflict. One of the major conflicts I can see in the city at the moment is we do need more housing. Right. We do need more housing. But where some of the sites we're looking to build houses are causing a lot of problems. Jonathan's team is having to spend a disproportionate amount of time in my ward just now because of developments that have gone AWOL, that uh, we've tried to fight against uh, common nature, i.e. if you've got a site at the bottom of a hill, the water will come down there. You know, nobody yet has changed water going up a hill. And as a result of that, Jonathan's having to spend a lot of time. So it's how are we going to build that in so that we give planning applications and that we do put the resources in before an application is approved, because again, in my ward, I've got um, I've got Jonathan's team out here, probably in a different site, just about every day of the week, fighting against some problem that's occurred. How are we going to resolve that? And is this something that will be covered in the July uh, adaptations? So we'll have clear instructions that will then go to planning, so that. It's how you deal with the point that Councillor Illingworth made. Mm. How do you get new houses built 
and not put them any, anywhere that's going to cause flooding problems because we do need the new housing. So I don't know how we can solve it, but I'm interested to know if Jonathan is going to be building something in, how we can do it. Uh, and if we could get some reassurance that it will be included in the July ones, then I'll be happy. Okie dokie. Again, regular reminder that the Climate Emergency Led Local Plan Review Policy Workshops are coming up soon, Councillor Anderson. I trust you'll be in attendance. Um, and you'll not listen as normal. <laughs> oh, it's tight. You cut me deep. Um, <laughs> It, it, that depends on the, the, the whether you say something sensible or not, Councillor Anderson. Uh, I'm sure, I'm, and I'm sure you will. Um, Jonathan, did you ever come back with respect to that? I'm wanting to move things along, but by all means. Um, uh, I can do. I'm very conscious of time myself. There's been lots we could say on, on a few of these items. And I think I suppose to come back to the last point you've just raised, Councillor Anderson, um, well, before the local plan review comment, about just building that into the adaptation plan. I think, that, that, yeah, a reassurance for me that the sense of compromise, the sense of resolving conflict and that how we balance risks is, is part and parcel of what we have to present. We have to present the fact that we've got a huge range of conflicting risks in the city and we will have decisions to make, but we need to put a process and a, you know, a, a, a plan in place that allows us to have those difficult conversations. I think we do do that through the planning system all the time. And I, yeah. I can't disagree with the amount of time we, we spend trying to make sure that people stick to the plan. Um, and that is really tricky. And maybe that's a, a wider, a wider thought process around, even if, whether it's, whether it's planning and flood risk or whether it's climate adaptation, maybe the, we need to emphasize the need for compliance and how we, help people to not just know what to do, but make sure that they do it. And, and there's an element there of collaboration and partnership working, and that's the spirit in which we enter it. But equally, sometimes we do have to accept that with it. Sometimes collaboration and joint working and the spirit of things is, isn't everything we need. And, and we do find sometimes that people don't deliver on, on their promises. And, and I think we do need to, when it's a serious, yeah. as adaptive to climate change, then actually ensuring compliance is extremely important because in the long run, uh, the consequences, you know, can be very significant and can cost us more yeah. in the long run. I, I, I completely agree. And there is a, a resources issue there. And I think that we we, we need, to, the country writ large needs, needs to face up to this, is going to need more. Councillor Buckley, and then I'm going to close up this item. Well, thank you, Chair. Just a couple of points, uh, quite briefly, actually. Um, Rosa, um, one of the um, captions on one of the slides uh, included... Um, uh, two million trees being planted, which we're aware of, of course. Um, and the only point I was going to make there is that these plantations are, um, are good, a good thing. Nobody's arguing about that. But just again on a local level, um, a lot of uh, attractive street trees, uh, they all have um, a life and all trees die in the end. And what we're finding is that there's a little bit of resistance from forestry to replace street trees. And I know it's a faff and it's only one tree at a time, but I think that's a point worth making. Um, uh, my second point was that um, we heard quite a bit today about, and it's a slightly different way of, um, slightly different language this morning in my view, because we heard about climate reality checks, climate resistance, climate adaptation. Um, to make us deal with a changing climate, as opposed to every phrase being um, the prevention of any kind of climate change. But also, just my final point was that um, we talk about these um, fairly um, local problems, uh, uh, the major problem, and this phrase, conflict resolution, We've got the worst war in 80 years, uh, it, which happened, it started two weeks ago. This is changing everything. You're going to have um, ordinary families not being able to afford the gas bills, uh, shortages and uh, fossil fuels coming back into the equation in a big way. So I think obviously it's something which is a reality and we just have to face it. Thank you, Chair. I mean, thanks, Councillor Buckley. I mean, I mean, on I'm going to bring Councillor Hayden in a, in a moment, but on, on those points, I mean, the last the last 
12 days of, to my mind, um, demonstrated the need for us to move even quicker on climate because that means moving away from all fossil fuel energy sources as quickly as humanly possible. Um, when I said a few months ago that we need a, a scale of mobilization akin to sort of the September 1939, I didn't mean that someone should actually start a war, though, by the way. I think, but it does underlie that at the national level, we really need to see that focus on a, a scale of mobilization to tackle climate. And that's surely, surely must have added national security impetus now because, you know, gas prices are going to be, have gone through the roof and it's going to hit everybody. And we're in, you know, and then both households and, and energy generation and businesses are incredibly exposed and vulnerable to that. Um, so that, yeah, we should be redoubling our efforts and tripling our efforts really. And uh, hopefully we'll see signs from that from government, but I'm not, not, not seeing that as yet. I've seen murmurings about expanding oil and gas exploration, which is just the worst kind of short-termism really when you think about it in response to the, the crisis that we're facing the twin crises that we're facing um councillor hayden and rose has got a hand up rose was it a specific point because i didn't want to bring it was, it was direct back to councillor buckley it's very short it's just to say yeah, sure. um you know in, in general on street trees don't don't hold hold back on like wanting to hold support back on, like, like a small thing but i think um for I think, I think, well-being um and for urban heat island effect you know in certain places then yeah. You know, street trees have a really important yeah. role. So it's just we've picked up it's like, oh, it's only one tree at a time. But I think, you know, ultimately they matter. So yeah. yeah. No, thanks for that. Councillor Hayden. Thanks. Um actually on that, we have a policy of replacing three trees for every one tree that is is taken down. Um, but they might not be in the street that they're taken from. But um if it's not possible to read you know um but they they will, will be put somewhere else as it as it were um i just wanted very quickly and i know that this has been quite a long item but it's really really important i can't mm. stress the importance of um and i want to thank um jonathan rosa and um oh I've forgotten his name he's gone now from much water um for their contributions um and actually um it was on that whole catchment i just really wanted to emphasize just how important that is and that with uh, the flood alleviation scheme the second part on the air valley going right up and jump to malontan where mm -hmm. it begins um two million trees being planted as you probably already have aware of but the farmers um getting involved up in the dales um because that directly affects what happens in leeds and and um and the uh, other towns along the air valley um and it's also about our restoration of our peatlands um and bogs and um and i know that the farmers are getting really involved and the environment agency are doing some excellent work up there so um yeah uh, i know the don valley was was mentioned and um, the upper Don valley um but i wanted to emphasize that it's so important and i'm really pleased with the work we're doing in the whole catchment and not just looking at the immediate thing thank you chair oh no thank you that's that's great well that was enormously informative um set of speakers and plans really good comms um from all three i thought that was really really important um and as somebody mentioned we should reflect that in our own communications in our own reports there's a lot to be uh, good practice to be shared so i'm going to bring that item to a close and move swiftly so thank you for coming rosa thank you for coming jonathan you're most welcome to stay and listen but if you want to slip away also completely understand and over to polly Hi, sorry, <laughs> slight, slight delayed reaction there. Um, right, so I'm just going to share my screen and I'm going to make it fairly um, snappy because I am conscious of time. So just give me one moment. My my screen, always, everything always goes go slow once I'm on a on Zoom or Teams. Right, there we go. So hopefully everyone can see that. Give me a nod to Councillor Warshaw if you can see that. Yep, it's looking yep. good. Brilliant. Um, so the Exec Board report, which this is 
in theory a quick synopsis of it's quite a long report I think it's probably about 30 pages with two quite in-depth appendices so I'm going to try and do a whistle stop to in about five to ten minutes so um, and then give people time for questions so in the report we flag some of the highlights that happened last year across the council so we have um, the picture there of the electric van scheme that was delivered which um, displaced 330,000 miles um, in terms of diesel driven mileage from from businesses but more importantly played a really key role in promoting electric vans um, across different sectors we have somebody there a proud owner of new solar panels through some of the grant schemes and the housing schemes that we've delivered over the year um, and then we have some air source heat pumps i think those ones are from john charles where we had the 25 million pounds of works that we installed across 40 different buildings starting to decarbonize our own estate um, and then to the right, connected to that, we have the new company set up by Synergist in Leeds as a direct result of all the green decarbonisation work that we've done. Um, so the, the kind of link between the jobs and skills is starting to happen because of that work and the growth of that industry now within the city. Um, and beneath that picture, we also have our jobs and skills event that we, we did. So we've developed standardised material that we can roll out to all schools, explaining actually what a green job is. Um, and that day was really interesting just to see the range of people talking from the food sector through to growing, through to construction um, and giving young people the opportunity to see that, you know, how many opportunities the kind of future holds for them. Um, because sometimes I think it, it can feel quite overwhelming in terms of some of the negative messages that, that are um, talked about. Then we have our, our tree planting, and I won't talk about that too much because we've already talked about tree planting and flood alleviation things today. And then obviously the work that's gone on with Connecting Leeds and we opened the first electric um, park and ride in the city. Um, and that is just a handful of some of the examples. And I think, yeah, I think we, oh, we also have the district heating because my, my photos are, are covering it. So um, last year saw massive expansion of the district heating network. Um, within the last month, we've just approved five new extensions that are going to start to take place um, and obviously in the context of what is happening in terms of gas prices district heating is becoming more and more attractive to, to businesses so having that already in place um, is absolutely crucial for the city and being able to provide green heat at lower cost um, one of the key parts of the the report was focused around kind of what the council's doing and around the energy strategy um, and how we are going to reduce our own emissions. So energy count accounts for about 83% of our scope one and scope two emissions. Um, so we, we put in place this kind of standard about how we reduce our energy, talking about the works that we're going to do to make our buildings as energy efficient as possible. But then also starting to talk about how we buy the balance of our energy. So using something called a power purchase agreement um, so that we are investing in a renewable asset and we're creating additionality in the system rather than just buying green energy that's already being created. Um, and also about our desire to cr create more energy locally, um, primarily through solar. Um, and also just about the changes we anticipate seeing in our energy demand through things like the move away from gas to air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps, um, but also the increase in electricity through the chain move away from diesel and petrol. Um, so there was a lot of detail in there about how the council as, a, as an entity will actually get to that reduction. And we expect to have halved our emissions by 2025 um, as a result of all those different strategies. And we're on track to deliver that. Um, we also talked then about the kind of change in policy. So we, we've always looked at kind of the how we can make any new developments as green as possible in terms of those that we construct ourselves. Um, however, there, has, there are sometimes barriers. So if we get given a grant to build, for example, a new school, sometimes it makes it really challenging to go to, to, towards net zero. So the commitment is really about developing that guidance in more detail, but also looking at the whole life cost. So if we build something that isn't net zero today, actually what is the retrofit cost of that? Yeah. And what are the implications? And actually does that change our decision-making process? Do we find that funding from elsewhere? Um, and so just making that a much more transparent process and, and having those more difficult conversations up front then the other thing that really changed is there were two key changes in this exec board report. One we've just discussed in detail. So there was a real emphasis on adaptation and resilience, which I think was new. But the other big change was the real focus around scope three. Um, 
so scope three is consumption emissions. So primarily it comes from things that we we buy. Um, however, it can also be um, things such as the mileage that we pay staff that they're not doing in their own cars. And so we're, we're, we've made a commitment to really look at that because it's estimated that that can be in the kind of high 80s to low 90s in terms of the percentage of emissions for a, for a local authority or for any business. Um, so actually, we need to look at that and we need to be taking real action on it. Um, so one of the key ones that we've talked about previously here is really around food and we made the food yeah. commitments that are up on the screen. There's lots of very specific actions looking at how we can grow some of our own food using waste heat. Um, the work we're doing with the University of Leeds to develop a carbon decision making tool so that actually we can put recipes in. It can give us advice about how we can improve their carbon footprint and um, we can use it as an engagement tool with members of the public. Um, and then there's also work going on with waste this year to do something similar around the, the, the impact of waste in Scope 3. Um, we've committed to work with adult social care for something similar. So we're starting to work through all the different strands of our procurement um, to try and really understand the emissions and see how what we can do to try and reduce them. Um, and then kind of more outward looking, um, there's been a number of different grants and I won't go into the detail because I'm conscious of time and we have talked about some of these before, but, you know, numerous different grants that we've received to start doing things like external wall insulation or ground source heat pumps in tower blocks and um, solar panels on homes. Um, so starting to really kind of improve some of the housing, although, you know, we've got to recognise it's a, a relatively small part of our housing stock of the whole city. Um, and at the moment, there's still a real gap probably around that able to pay market and how we support yep. that. And there's, there's work going on to see how we address that moving forward. Um, in terms of transport, I haven't picked up the whole transport strategy because you know I think the, the report refers to the transport strategy and cross references. Um, but one of the big focuses was around the electric vehicle charging point strategy um, and about how we move from kind of dealing with the grants that are available and how we maximise those grants to actually bring in private investment into the city to get a really sustainable, well spread out, good high function and network of charge points. So that that is really the focus this year is about moving to much more rapid growth in electric vehicle charge points um, to make sure that, you know, all sectors of the community can access them. Um, and that we can support the growth that we are seeing in electric vehicles now. So that, that work's ongoing. Um, so in terms of sort of up and coming policy, we will be coming back to executive board this year with a Better Homes Net Zero strategy, which will look at that able to pay and look at how you know we can help facilitate that. We're not going to be able to provide funding, so it's more about an enabling role. Um, we're also coming back with the food strategy, which will look at all aspects of the food supply chain and, and what as a city, what we should be doing to make ourselves resilient for food. So it, it cuts across the adaptation and resilience, but also making sure the food we serve is sustainable. We've talked about the adaptation and resilience plan. It links to the future talent plan that we, we've also had presented here before. And of course, links to the local, local plan update um, that we, again, we have discussed here and in a number of the working groups. So I will leave it there and let people ask questions. It was a whistle stop tour of a fairly long report, but. No, that's great, Polly. As we say on this committee, there is a lot going on in Leeds. Uh, we're, we're very proud of the work we're doing. Um, so I'm going to open that up for questions. I've got Council Wadsworth first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask Paul in the exec report with regards to the um, air source heat pumps, will it be reported in that exec board the um, disruption that was caused to the Woodland Air Brew Leisure Centre, of which we still not got a replacement plan um, either in place or um, advised to elected members of what will take place as the contractor destroyed the Woodland at the point of the year earlier. And with regards to the mileage, um, surely we are... Uh, employees who do a lot of mileage on our behalf, surely we are looking into how they move to an electric vehicle, uh, either through an interest-free loan, which we gave to our taxi drivers, which was very useful, or, or through providing them with an electric car uh, to deal with the emissions side of things. And with regards to the charging points, when we expand charging points, can we look into the plug? Now, this is beyond, Chair, my... my capabilities of, of technology I, I could not hey. understand why when we brought in electric vehicles we couldn't um universally have a 
plug, but I'm led to believe from people who charge electric vehicles that there are many different charging rates and many different plugs. And I have had some put in my ward that are only any use for the Tesla system. Um, I was heavily um, approached by the council to have these charging points put in, which I accepted that they could go into a car park. But now residents are coming back and say they're not any use to us because they're only any use to Teslas. Um, Polly will know all about that, so I'll leave it up to her um, and do the points as well. Thanks a lot, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wadsworth. Yeah, plug standardisation. Okay. How do we sort that out, Polly, in one city? <laughs> Yeah, that was an interesting range of questions, wasn't it? So let's let's start with the, the Tesla. Um, I, I'm assuming that you're referring to the NG charging network, um, Councillor Wadsworth. I'm assuming it's that network that you're referring to in terms of the ones installed. So the rapid chargers that are for taxi and um, if, yeah, if I am, not, Polly, the, the, yeah, the, the ones that look like a wardrobe and and our, and our rapid chargers because that's yeah. what people need is rapid charging. Yeah, so um, they certainly don't only charge Teslas. Um, I've seen many many different cars charging on them in, in where I okay. live locally. So it it feels like there's some sort of I don't know under misunderstanding or issue there. So if you've got specific details, if you want to send them through, and we can work through them with individual residents and tenants, um, but they're certainly not just for you know there's no taxi drivers driving um teslas and they're all charging in them with them um in terms of standardization of plug i mean it's a it's kind of beyond our control to a certain extent you know that's something where there needs to be national policy in terms of standardization there has been discussions going on yes. um, and i think the indication was that the government has kind of given a message that people need to work together better and if they don't then something then legislation will follow um, i think the role that we see ourselves playing is that enabler in terms of making sure you know that we have competition in the city so you know yeah. you wouldn't you wouldn't want all our petrol stations to be operated by one company because they'd have a monopoly in the same way we don't want all our charge points operated by one because it gives healthy competition so i think that that is our role to try and make sure that we get that variety and we provide a good infrastructure going forward and um, in terms of the woodland i i am aware of the issue um, i'm not aware of the resolution so i will pick that up and come back to you outside of the meeting um, and in terms of Grey Fleet, there is work going on so obviously pre-covid um, we we monitor the data of what mileage people are doing um, and that has dropped substantially and hasn't picked back up still um, so we're looking and working with different groups um, and just about to kind of restart that a bit more in force but one of the ideas is about things like electric pool cars where they will work um, and maybe using some of the vehicles from the electric van hire scheme to start to trial that and see how, how effective that is um, and there is also the car lease scheme that's going to become available shortly, if not already, um, that's available yeah. for staff to help them make that transition to electric. So there's various strands going on to look at that. In terms of our overall scope three, it is a fairly small proportion, um, which is always a challenge about where do you focus kind of our limited resource, but there is, if, is efforts going on. Stop there. Uh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, at, at the risk of lighting a blue touch paper and running away, is there an EU standard for electric charging plugs? And shouldn't that be the one the e the UK shadows? Wouldn't that make all the sense in the world? I don't think there is. I'd have to double check. I'm not. Okay. I've got, I've got I, I can answer, in my I can answer that. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is, uh, Neil, is there's a range of different charging capabilities and technologies within the car. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Tesla, I think, did their own sweet thing. Um, but they do. But there's basically a thing called Camido, which is the, the default standard. It's like the equivalent of your three-pin plug, which yeah. will up, but that will only go up to a certain speed. As the newer cars that will charge at your know, crazy fast speeds and super super rapid fast charging have their own di different standards. So it's less of um, there isn't a standard across the industry. It's right. more that as the charging technology that the cars can accept that the cable that would charge at seven kilowatts won't charge at 50 kilowatts and therefore it has a different plug to stop you plugging it in. But most cars, most cars will charge, will accept a cable at the default one. So if you look at the ones that are outside the Civic Hall and most of the pod point ones that you see right. around Leeds, th those, are the, those are what you would class as the, the vanilla standard that every car should be able to accept. 
Noted. Oh, gosh. All right. Okay. Right. I'm going to close that down because that's clearly a Pandora's box. <laughs> but thank you, Councillor Hartbrook. That was informative. Right. Councillor Flint, Councillor Anderson, Councillor Garthway. So, Councillor Flint. Okay. I think um, Councillor Anderson was before me, but um, I don't mind going. <laughs> oh, hang on. Well, in the interest of fairness, let's have Councillor right, Anderson. We'll not we'll have a battle with that. Councillor <laughs> okay. Council Flint, off you go. Yes, Apologies for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I noticed that. Um, in the report it says about the newsletter going out to about 5,000 people I just wondered if there was um, a kind of plan on how to increase that because um, it feels like the engagement side of it with um, the public is really important and there's lots of good things to get people on board with um, and I just wondered how um, you know we can help with that whether there's um, some, some kind of graphic or invitation that we can share with people in our war because I'm sure there's more people that would want to receive that and the communication and engagement side of it is really important and then sorry going back to electric charging points um, <laughs> briefly um, the 30 percent of houses in the city that have no um, parking so can't get their own charging point and that is an issue in the streets around where I live um, just wondered what the um, I still don't quite understand what the strategy is for those houses um, because there's lots of people in my ward who are really up for getting an electric car but yeah. just don't know how they would charge it. And um, a lot of people talk to me about um, charging off um, lamp posts, and I wondered if that was part of the plan. That's it. Thanks, Emma. Um, Polly, on those points. Okay, so in terms of the newsletter, I mean, it's one strand of our communication strategy. So when we did, we came around the um, community committees recently we kind of re-promoted it asked members whether they wanted to be signed up to it and um, I'm sure we can produce kind of a graphic or something you can use on Twitter to sort of re-promote it again and um, yes. when, whenever we do events or speaking events or anything like that we we kind of put it on the end to try and encourage more uptake um, and we do a lot of cross kind of fertilization I suppose between different you know like food wise and things like that in terms of trying to grow that um, but if anyone's got any other suggestions we're, we're always open to that and um, we find that kind of peer-to-peer -peer communication works really well so we always use the yeah. example of the electric van and the plumber and the you know 2000 YouTube video shares in terms of getting specific messages and the same with some of the housing and solar so those sort of things can be done on, on a more local basis in terms of the, the charging point and the those who don't have um, space to park their car, we are looking at kind of some sort of hub basis, um, and that's part of the strategy for this year. So we we don't think from a city point of view it makes sense for everyone to have a charge point outside the house um, especially when you think about active transport and accessibility and disability with you know with cables going across pavements and things um, so we are looking more a place where we could have a hub within localities that hub could be in a local car park if there's one nearby it could be in a cul-de-sac so all that work is going on to see see how we map that out we have been just been recently announced as one of the partners with government on their geospatial work they're doing around electric charging which will help with how we do that mapping and making sure we get the spread so um, and it's always good to be at the forefront of, of how that thinking is developing in terms of lampposts we have looked at it and there are places that do it our lampposts actually are too are set too far back and um, so some people have the lamppost much nearer to the curb than we do so so that has been sort of deemed not not really to work within Leeds, mm. um, but I am aware of that solution and we have looked at it in various different places. Thanks, Polly. Is that okay, Emma? Yeah. Um, Councillor Anderson. Just briefly, uh, we've I know because you've done exceptionally good work in my ward with the council housing side in terms of the decarbonisation. However, what are we going to do about the private rented sector? Now, I'm not specifically talking about the LS6 landlords, I'm talking about the landlords elsewhere in the city yeah. where they tend to be looking after the more disadvantaged people in society. Not, not universally, not all of them, but if we don't get improved heating energy into these houses, how are we going to... Do, I mean, the government don't appear to be targeting private landlords. So how can we do something by working cross-party or whatever it is, particularly now that we've got a housing minister as one of our MPs, how can we 
start getting more money put into the private sector. I'm very pleased with what we've done within the council's own stock, but what can we do to try and address that issue? Because these are the people, these are the landlords that are looking after some of the mm. most deprived and most needy people uh, in the city. I think yeah. that's um, a billion dollar question, uh, yeah. Councillor Anderson. Polly, did you want to? So there have there have been some of the grants that have been targeted at the private rent sector. They have to provide match funding. Um, so we have done work within the private rent sector this year, um, and there has been some appetite. It's become more challenging because of things that we've talked about here before, like the PAS 2035 standard that's pushed some of the costs up, some of the criteria that we have to meet um, make it more more challenging. But I think it is still trying to work down that that road and having a look at how we support. Um, I think the challenge often is that some of the national policy that's set doesn't take into account the value the valuation difference in houses. Um, and I think if people have been to that planning and energy working group, you know, um, there was a discussion there about some of the policies can be a bit regressive if you're asking people to invest 20,000 in a house that's worth 80,000 versus that same investment in a house in London that might be worth three times as much. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to go on at a national level, I think, in terms yeah. of putting the Leeds context to it. Um, and we did have Lord Callanan up and we showed him some of the challenges that we have in our back to back houses um, showed him some of the challenges with the heat and building strategy in terms of that, that specific stock. So we are really conscious of, of how we solve some of those problems. And they're not all just to do with land rules. Some of them are to do with the stock and some of the technology developments. Yep. Um, so we, we continue to work on that. We continue to look at the lot, like the national picture and work with those different kind of industry specialists to try and find solutions for it. But yeah, no, we are very, very aware of it, though, I would say. It is a it is an enormous task. Again, Councillor Andon, it speaks to what we've mentioned several many times on this committee. It's just the scale of mobilisation of resources is just is, is very much divorced from the scale of the challenge we face at the moment, unfortunately. Um, Councillor Garthwaite. Yes, very briefly, back to the ever exciting topic of electric charge points. <laughs> <laughs> about which I can talk for a long, long time, but I shan't. Um, just to say that I think a multiplicity will be with us for quite some time yet because the second-hand market and even third-hand market in electric cars is growing all the time. That wasn't the case to start with because the batteries basically deteriorated so much that you could hardly get any mileage out of them. Now things have changed enormously. And I think that is a very good sign because a new electric car is out of the scope of lots of people to buy, but a second-hand one, a third-hand one is, is much more possible. But that means that there isn't going to be a one-size-fits-all for quite a while, and we have to take account of that. Um, thanks, Al. Yeah, it's points well made. Um, uh, Council Forsyth. Um You'll be pleased to know I'm not going to talk about electric vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right, I just wanted to pull out one or two um, sections from the report, which um, is obviously concentrates on what the council's doing in terms of um, the climate emergency, um, but also sort of reflects into the city as a whole. The top of page 19 there is the city's emissions continue to show a steady decline, but the pace of change will currently not be sufficient to meet net zero by 2030. After all we've heard this morning, we really need to think really what that does mean. So shortly after the, declared, the, the current emergency was declared, um, as members, we had very good counselling, uh, sorry, counselling, um, teaching from um, training from Polly and her team and had it all explained about the carbon budget and that our carbon budget will be used up before 2030. But this is all worked out on the basis of just scope one and scope two emissions. It does not include scope three emissions. So I really remember very pleased now, obviously, that we're now looking at the scope three emissions. And of course, it also doesn't include emissions from aviation. However, there is another part in the report, section 11, that says that within in 2021, there have been some positive steps forward at a national level. 
And part B is, says, for the first time, the UK's sixth carbon budget will incorporate the UK's share of international and shipping emissions. So we really need to be looking at the scope three and aviation emissions. Leeds likes to be ahead of the curve. It likes to lead by example. Well, this is a real opportunity. And of course, I am talking here about Leeds Bradford Airport and about the plans for um, the possible expansion. And I understand that lots of us have had letters to that extent from our residents. Then just thinking about today, can I just come back to some of the things that have been said today. Things like, we need to walk the talk. The cost of inaction is greater than action. And Rosa in her presentation said, we need to think differently. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Councillor Forsyth. I mean, yeah, we, we, there is now being over approximately the last year, there's been um, a wealth of further evidence regarding um, the climate emergency, including the Climate Change Commission's um, sixth carbon budget, which did talk heavily, heavily about scope three emissions and about shipping aviation emissions and made some very strong recommendations. Um, you have noted in the, um, in, at the start of our meeting, um, in Jonathan's excellent presentation, the comments from HM Treasury about the cost of doing nothing. And then just over two and a half weeks ago, we had the six IPCC report, which we've put in the chat, a link in the chat, folks. I recommend everybody read it and digest it and let that inform our decision making. Um, it, is, it is grim reading. It is grim reading. Uh, it's been a little, unfortunately, a little bit underreported due to events caused by uh, Russia's imperialistic war of aggression that is now waging in Ukraine. Um, but there is obviously the elephant in the room is that all this evidence is mounting up and we've had very little in terms of policy response from central government. And a lot of these policy issues really do need national government to take a lead. And I think that's what enormously disappointing across the, the council chamber and across the parties in Leeds that there isn't yet that urgency and impetus from government. Um, indeed, I've noticed there's a group of MPs set up a, a, net, a, a group to sort of question net zero, which I think is incredibly alarming. Um, and it's not what, given the weight of evidence, it's absolutely the last thing that UK legislators should be even contemplating. So there is a, a, a lot, a lot, a lot to be concerned about. Um, regarding Le Leeds Bradford Airport, obviously there's going to be the inquiry in September. Um, and it is extremely regrettable that the, the national uh, policy environment has not moved one iota from last March. It's incredibly regrettable given the weight of evidence. In fact, with the inspector's report on Bristol and Stansted, um, it may even have got worse. I haven't um, fully appraised myself for those yet, but looking from the, the summaries, it's, 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 it, it's not looking good. Um, the inspector reports carry enormous weight in planning circumstances. So it is, it is very distressing, actually, that the inspector is not yet giving climate emergency the, the true weight it deserves. And I think that's something for all, all of us to consider in, in who work in planning across the country and we'll be lobbying government hard um, to, to, make, to make sure it makes those changes. Has anyone got any, well, any points to add on Council of Sources points? Because otherwise, we, I am a little bit conscious of time. We have got open forum to do, which are two very interesting contributions. And then we've got a brief working groups update. We did start a little bit late, colleagues. So if you'll indulge us running until about 10 past 12, if, that, if that's okay. Um, so if there's no further commentary, um, look forward to the report going to, to exec board and obviously we've got full council, the annual report is coming to full council. I'm sure there'll be some fantastic contributions towards the end of March on that. Um, so, um, Harriet, open forum. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've received one written submission from yep. Linda Kitching from the Clean Air Alliance, which I'm just going to read out on her behalf. Um, so... It says, I represent Clean Air Alliance in asking that there will be an alternative festival on the 5th of November, on finite, since the format we've grown up with leaves us with polluted air. Whilst appreciating that risk assessments are in place, there is no consideration of longer term health of attendees, including council staff or local residents. 
The community bonfires in 2020 and 2021 were cancelled due to COVID, but we understand that air quality had not been considered. COVID has caused a break in tradition for many people and 2022 would be a good time to review the whole issue. The results of research carried out by the University of Leeds, which makes somber reading, indicates that dioxins may stay in the air for up to two weeks. We know that respiratory clinicians in Leeds hospitals are concerned about the damage which smoke and particulates from bonfires cause to health, particularly with the cumulative impact of COVID. Whilst acknowledging that the council puts on a good show, we recognise that we know that councillors regularly receive complaints from constituents forced to stay at home on that night because of the, no the noise and the smoke of fireworks, inconsiderate parking, breathing difficulties and large crowds, whilst many, many people affected do not complain. The events exclude sections of the community. There are no go area for those with mobility issues and for families with young children due to, due to high tightly packed crowds and difficulty children have seen displays. Also of concern is the state of parks afterwards where the bonfires have been held. The litter is picked up by council staff and volunteers and whilst the grass does grow again it's an effort and it costs the council and a cost that the council need, needn't happen. Since signing up to the climate emergency measures many councils are looking at alternatives to bonfires and fireworks. For example Ashbourne, Edinburgh, London, Newcastle, Norwich, all of which have had laser light shows, plus London and Edinburgh using drones too with a spectacular success. Perhaps 5th of November bonfire night could be combined with a hugely successful light night with imaginative bonfire and firework displays. Gradually more districts could be included and use iconic buildings as the backdrop, such as Kirk's Labby, Temple Newsom, Guy's Lead and Morley, Weatherby Town Halls, Hunslet Library, Royal, Royal Armouries. And since the displays would be spread over a whole evening, not just for the fire burns or the fireworks let off, people would be spread out too, creating revenue generating possibilities for the council from food, drinks and other vendors. It's likely that many residents who have bought fireworks and watched bonfires over the years could not explain the origin of this British custom. And I guess for the remainder, the origins are of no significance anymore. We ask for your assurance that this event will be brought up to date with the environment to be inclusive for all residents. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Harriet. I mean, there are some really good points raised in that. I think we should um, give that due consideration. Um, at a later date, so if I can agreement, I'm not seeing any dissent, that's good. Um, next one then, uh, Harriet. Thank you. Um, we've received a, a video, it's slightly longer than usual, Chad, but you've agreed to, um, to let us play it from Climate Action Leads. So, Chad, when you're ready, please. Thank you. Can you all see that video before I press, press play? Yep. Paul, Professor Paul Chatterton's frozen face. Oh, but we can't hear him. And I work at the University of Leeds. I'm here today speaking to you um, for my role um, as City Movement Building Lead as part of Climate Action Lead, the £2.5 million national lottery funded programme looking at how to promote climate action across Leeds' communities. So I'm, I'm here to talk to you today about our work around. Um, what we call the Leeds Donut and our group, the Leeds Donut Coalition. This is primarily um, an invitation. We have a launch event on the 28th of April, and I wanna give you a little taster about what this work is about and what we're gonna to talk to you more about on the 28th of April. So I'm just going to um, share my screen so you can um, understand a little bit more about our work through um, a slide pack I'm gonna show you. Um, through. So the group I'm talking to you about today is called the Leeds Donut Coalition and it's part of our climate action Leeds work in the city um, and it's also partly funded by um, the University of Leeds and it's part of the National Lottery funded work. Um, really the title of what I want to talk to you about today in the next three or four minutes is called How Can Leeds Thrive and Respect All People and Planet? Now there's this intriguing idea of this donut group so what am I talking about when I say the Leeds Donut Coalition? Yeah well look it's from a book called Donut Economics by the University of Oxford economist Kate Raworth right and she basically um, draws a donut shape um, and the idea of the donut is that if you live in the donut, which is the light green part on this diagram, it's the place where it's safe 
and equal and people can thrive. People fall inside the donut where it's less safe, where you fall below what we call what we call the social foundation. Um, and they are linked to the 16 um, sustainable development goals. And these are the internationally recognized foundations that people should all have in able to thrive. Now, there's also a ceiling so people can fall outside the top of the donut and they're what we call planetary boundaries. And at the moment, um, many aspects of our life are exceeding that donut, things like um, climate change, biodiversity loss, um, ocean acidification, nitrogen use. So there's, there's, two, there's two ways you can step outside the donut. You can fall below it where you don't have the social foundations for a good life and you, life can exceed above it where you start to compromise um, the ability of the environment to, to have a safe future. Yeah. So this donut is a safe place to live. So it's a very simple um, graphic in, in representation of the challenges we're up against. What we're doing with the Leeds a donut coalition very simply is we're doing a simple mapping exercise to map that onto where Leeds is at in terms of the donut is Leeds in that donut ring is it between the the people live and thrive with um, above the social foundation and below that ceiling yeah um, and what we've done essentially uh, let me just talk you through it's part of our city planning process we're doing for climate action Leeds um, we're looking at this across different sectors and the different communities um, we're hoping to set up a city centre hub where we can show this work. Um, as you know, we've got a five year programme of work and we want to build this donor economics idea in Leeds and we want to launch it on the 28th of April. Um, I'll say more about that in a second. So that's the key, key date for you all. So we'd love to have you there. Yeah. Now, what this donut work does, it, it asks four questions. Yeah. Um, Two are about local issues and two are about global issues. The first big question is, um, how can all the people of Leeds thrive? It's, that's really about the local conditions and whether people are meeting that social foundation. The second question is, how can Leeds be as generous as the wild land next door? So what it does, it looks at the local conditions and how we're treating local nature. Then there's the two global ones. Um, the, the, the first global one is, are we respecting the well-being of people worldwide? That's the global aspect of whether we're meeting the social foundation. And the second global one is, how are we treating the, the rest of the, the global ecosystem? Yeah, the rest of the planet. So there's four dimensions there. And all we've done is a very simple mapping exercise against those four questions. Yeah. Um, for what we call the, the first Leeds Donut City Portrait. And we're going to present that on the 28th um, of April. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to talk through these, but these are some of the stuff you'll see on the 28th. Cause we've done much more work at the moment getting to these. So the first lens, the social, local social lens, looks at those 16 sustainable development goals. Yeah, and we've done a cross check of like what we call a snapshot in Leeds. I won't go through these now because we'll talk more about them on the uh, 28th of April. But it really looks at the social conditions. Are people thriving in Leeds? The second lens, and, and the question is, is that within the donut? Yeah. The second lens looks at Leeds' nature and against issues like water, land, air and uh, waste matter. Is Leeds within the donut? So we look at different ecosystem services and how we're treating them in Leeds. Yeah. So the question is, are they within the donut? Okay. Um, the third lens is, does Leeds respect planetary boundaries? Um, what impact as a result in life in Leeds are we having on the ecosystem outside Leeds and the rest of the planet? Yeah. And what we know is that actually, given the lifestyle we have in Leeds and the things we depend upon, we're currently outside the donut, especially exceeding those planetary boundaries, especially in terms of biodiversity loss and our carbon footprint. The fourth one which are often overlooked is what kind of effects are we having on people uh, across the world, yeah? And at the moment, this is quite an interesting one because we're not sure whether we're in the donut, there's more work to be done, but what, we're cer what we certainly know we do is we import lots of social harms into Leeds 
as a result of the things we depend on for life at least you know clothes books computers they harm other people in the world and we import those harms into leads and we'll talk through those on the 28th right so really the whole framing for our work is can leads live in the donut in this safe and just operating space for humanity so this is not a complete snapshot what i've just showed you you'll find out on the 28th when we launch our, our detailed report what we do know is there's a huge amount of amazing work donut type activities happening in Leeds. Um, and we know we have all the knowledge and skills and abilities and examples to move towards that safe space and all the great stuff that certainly is happening with the council in terms of some of the, some of the policies and practices and procedures that are coming on stream and the new strategic direction in the best city plan, yeah? But this is a call to all change makers, right? It's a particular way of looking at the city. So what I wanna stress is that this is not a new strategy document. This is a framework for analysis that can help shape and support the existing strategies which we're developing as a city. So what we want to do is offer a thinking and action tool, yeah, which will support and amplify all the existing amazing work which is going on in the city, including the local plan update, the best city ambition plan, yeah, the emerging climate emergency action plan, all those amazing stuff, the transport strategy, the new housing strategy. This, I think, will help us understand the challenges we're up against and what good looks like. And really answer that question, what kind of leads do we want by 2030s, yeah? Okay, we've got a really wonderful donut team emerging, a, a, a group of people working on this, working with uh, Jenny from Comms and Engagement, um, some of our um, ex-master students looking at policy analysis, Katrina and Anisha did a lot of the work behind this, so great thanks to them. Joel, who all, also already works on global modelling at the university, and my colleagues Irena and Andy, who are leading some of the design work on this. And then we've got some great community partners there in Otley 2030 and Shannon and, and Marvina Jackson from Angel House. So we're going to do some youth testing, some community testing, and really think about how to involve and engage people through this. It's just really the donut for us is a way to start conversations, yeah, and show them some snapshots of leads. And once we've got this snapshot, we want to then start to really use that as conversations to dig down and take it in the places that people want to take it. Okay, so you know what could our vision for Leeds be? You know that that's that's really the key the key thing we want to look at. And the final slide is look, twenty eighth of April. That's the key date. You'll hear much more about it. We'll invite you all um, via SEAT coordinator. And um, we've got a, a one day a week donut post which is going to support this work going forward. If you know any additional resources to support our work, let us know. But plans for twenty two. Uh, 2022 going forward more youth testing more community testing and more showcasing in this city center hub can you help us find a city center venue which we desperately need okay so those are there some ideas um about this donut framework hope that was useful there's loads of videos and resources we can show you if you're interested and come and talk more in more detail appreciate this was very brief but we just wanted to whet your appetites really and see you again um in late april thanks very much Wow. <clears throat> Thanks. That was a that was an excellent video. That looks really, really interesting. Hope everyone's going to put the 28th in the diary. Um, it could be a really good event. Um, hopefully it will be. Um, right. So that's all noted. Uh, Polly, working groups, and then we can wrap up. Oh, my wouldn't come off mute. I'm not having a lot of luck today. Um, so I'll, I'll make it quite quick. So two of the working groups have met since we last we last met so the transport and behavior change working group met and they discussed the um, vision zero so looking at how we get to know um, deaths or serious injuries on the road by 2040 um, and there was a lot of discussion on that and fed into the consultation on that strategy and then there was also a presentation on the public e-bike car and again there was a lot of debate around that and how that scheme will develop and um, and then the next meeting of that group will be looking at 20 minute neighbourhoods um, across the city. And then in terms of the energy group, um, just give me one sec. So in January, the group focused on the energy strategy. So what I presented on earlier, so looking at the council's activities and energy consumptions and members were briefed on the market position for energy price on the council's approach to forward purchasing its gas and electricity um, and looking at how we were reducing consumption, becoming more energy efficient and increasing the level of energy source from renewables. So similar to what I present on today, but we went through it in a lot more, yes, more detail. Um, and 
also then in March, we're going to use it to look at the local plan update um, in the policy workshop and have an in-person meeting for a couple of hours to go through that in more detail. The food and the finance group haven't met. When the food group next meet, it will be to look at the national food strategy um, and to specifically look at it from a sustainability point of view and to see actually where you know from the commentary I've read on it the, the implication is that there are lots of good recommendations but or lots of good things that need to happen but actually the recommendations on that element are a bit weaker so we need to do some preparation work to prepare for that group and the finance group still hasn't moved just through lack of capacity I'm afraid but I will try and do something about that because I know there was a desire to get that running yeah. again. That's great, Polly. Thanks. And yeah, funding is ever the the the, the, uh, the big problem. So, um, right. So, uh, is anyone got any questions on working groups? And then, if not, then I will wrap up the meeting. Nope. Fantastico. Um, right. In that case, folks. Um, uh, I think that was a really good meeting. We covered an awful lot of ground. Some, some really uh, good speakers and contributions from yourselves as members. Thank you very much for that. Um, has anyone got any any other business to bring up? Council Fossey. Just to say, um, I've not captured all the links that are in the chat. Will they be sent out, please? Yeah. Uh, I can circulate Rose's slides with all the links on. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Great. In that case, folks, thank you so much. And I'm going to close the meeting. Thanks, Brilliant.